If you've ever debugged something electrically sensitive, uh, you probably know what it's like to experience the cosmic wonder and horror of seeing your unit tests start to fail when the ceiling fan turns on. Um, building a theremin, playing it, uh, feels like that all the time. And uh, after a while, the feeling starts to extend even to speaking about it. Uh, and I think that can be very difficult to talk about why that's so awesome, a neutral definition of awesome, uh, without sounding like you've lost your mind. Uh, but the chasing that high is kind of an integral part of what makes it worth doing. Uh, you're, you're cruising inside the tolerance margins. Uh, you're literally using your own capacity for electrical interference as a creative output. So I'm not exactly sure what version of this talk I'm gonna end up giving today because it, as with many of these projects, feels very sort of shimmery and prismatic. Lights reflects off it in all directions at once and when you turn to look, you're always a little surprised that you're seeing your own reflection, but uh, you never know exactly what angle you're gonna end up looking at yourself from. <laughs> um, the theremin is one of the first electronic instruments. Uh, as you saw, it's controlled without any physical contact from the performer. And uh, it was invented by a uh, It was, in a, it was invented by Leon, or Lev Terman, in the 1920s Soviet Union as a side result of research into proximity sensors. Uh, he realized its potential as a musical instrument, so uh, he, is an in, he and the invention emigrated to New York in 1927. Um, and its popularity was boosted by the virtuosic Clara Rockmore, who also went to the US around that time. Uh, in 1929, RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, decided that the theremin might earn its place as a concert instrument of the future, grabbing market share from the rare American household that was uh, wealthy enough to own both a piano and a radio. Uh, keep in mind, this preceded the widespread adoption of the record player. Uh, and uh, they began producing a commercial model, the aptly if boringly named RCA theremin, which uh, cost about $230, uh, over $3,000 in today's dollars. Um, can you feel it? It's 1929. Here we stand at the, the close of the roaring 20s, the world just barely emerging from a devastating pandemic. Strange technologies threatening to upend everyday life. <clears throat> Teetering on the knife edge between global chaos of an, un, <laughs> an unprecedented magnitude. The things that are good today, they could get a lot better, or things that are bad, they sure could get a lot worse. Uh, they got worse. Um, so, uh, <laughs> in 1929, the uh, invisible hand extended its middle finger and uh, production of the RCA theremin ceased. Despite that, even though only a few of them remain today and only a few thousand ever existed, the residual interest was enough to keep the instrument alive in the fringes of the American psyche for several more decades. Uh, and in the 50s, it manifested mostly as futuristic spooky sounds in sci-fi movies like The Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, but uh, notably in 1954, a young inventor named Bob Moog got his start designing and selling theremin kits, which he uh, continued through the 50s and the early 60s. Uh, and as transistors began to replace tubes and uh, voltages began to shrink across the board, uh, Moog's theremins became sleeker and form factors became more flexible, moving away from the writing desk form factor and more towards the box on a pole. Uh, in 1970, he took a quick break from theremins to uh, invent the synthesizer and uh, <laughs> arguably sort of kicked off our entire modern age of music. Um, but uh, he actually did quite a bit more after that. Uh, after, uh, after he stepped away from the Moog Music Corporation in 1978, he started Big Briar and immediately returned to his first love, making theremins again, uh, iterating on his designs from multiple decades in the past of selling them, but also publishing many of the schematics and providing personal tech support to people that called him on the phone. Um, in 1996, uh, Big Briar released the Etherwave standard on the right, which is the best selling theremin of all time. Uh, and it's been returned to the Moog name today, but it remained in continuous production for 24 years, almost entirely unchanged for its entire lifespan. Um, in 2004, Bob Moog designed the Etherwave Pro uh, which was invented uh, to be a sort of a hybrid of the Etherwave standard and the historic RCA-like designs of Yor, 
uh, the sort of it didn't use tubes or high voltages uh, except in the DC converter, but uh, it was supposed to be the platonic ideal and the purest expression of the instrument. Uh, but sadly, it was his last project because shortly thereafter he passed away, and uh, Moog the company had to soldier on without him. Uh, side note: I just got one of these. Uh, it's awesome. In 2014, they made the Theremini, which was an attempt at a cheaper, beginner-friendly digital theremin. Uh, and in 2020, they released the Clarivox Centennial, which was an attempt to rehash the Etherwave Pro in an extremely limited edition, a mixed signal model with a digital front end uh, that was encrusted with a king's ransom of uh, expensive TI DSP chips and ST microcontrollers. <laughs> Did you feel it? <laughs> we're on the cusp of the roaring 20s. <laughs> Yet again, we're about to ring in the new decade with an exciting new theremin, but uh, the pesky invisible hand comes in and pokes us in the eye. <clears throat> and uh, I, didn't, I didn't come here to tear anyone down. Obviously, this sucks. Um, and especially not the single entity most responsible for keeping the instrument alive, especially an instrument that was so self-evidently a labor of love. But uh, and in this context, it's hard, to mention, it's hard not to mention that uh, two weeks ago, Moog was acquired by a giant conglomerate. Um, the, the Clarivox had problems, and uh, people that really were looking for a concert instrument were uh, disappointed in some real ways. Uh, so what's my talk about? I just talked about Moog for 10 minutes. Um, do we really need Theremin History 101? Well, it's not easy to build the Theremin. Uh, you may have done it from a kit, but there's a, a difference, I think, between a kit Theremin and a performance Theremin. So and, and Moog knows the field better than anyone else, but as you can see, they're still struggling. Um, so I'm going to talk about why it's hard. <clears throat> a natural follow-up to that question is analog synths are kind of generally have gone the way of the dodo. Couldn't that have happened to theremins as well? Why don't we have a good digital theremin and why haven't we had it for decades? Um, so why haven't theremins made that jump? Well, I mean, it's not, they're not like migratory animals, right? But uh, they, uh, they can't just go digital for the winter. But uh, the, the natural follow-up question is, uh, Duh, is because no one cared. Um, but, uh, you know, spoiler alert, uh, someone did. And uh, so that's the last question that I'm trying to answer is, uh, why is this worth your time? <clears throat> uh, so let's, let's talk shop a little, just level set expectations. Um, right off the bat, one hand modulates pitch and the other hand modulates volume. So uh, when I move my right hand, this antenna is a little flaky because it's made of uh, <coughs> hobby metal, um, but uh, that's my fault, not the instruments. Uh, when I move my right hand towards the pitch antenna, pitch goes up. When I move it away, the pitch goes down. Um, and in a traditional configuration, when I move my left hand closer to the volume, uh, it goes down, and when I move it further away, it goes up. Uh, you know, go figure. But uh, once you get used to it, it, it kind of actually makes intuitive sense. It's like when Apple reversed the scroll directions on all the trackpads. <laughs> <laughs> Except it's been this way for 100 years. Uh, so we still, haven't, we still haven't answered how any of this works, but uh, let's, let's, quick, let's take a quick look at the design uh, for the EtherWave standard, which is the, the one that everyone has, the one that I have. Uh, uh, to be clear, yeah, it's not this. Um, but this is uh, Electronic Musician 87, February 1996, uh, in, in Bob Moog's own words. Uh, when you bring your hand near a theremin antenna, you are actually forming a variable capacitor. The antenna is one plate and your hand is the other. During normal operation, the hand capacitance is less than one picofarad, which is a very small capacitance indeed. Each antenna forms a resonant circuit with a group of inductors collectively called an antenna coil. At or near the resonant frequency, a tiny change in hand capacitance results in a larger change in the impedance of the antenna circuit as a whole. <laughs> uh, Q1, Q2, and their associated components constitute the variable pitch oscillator, the frequency of which is slightly higher than the resonant frequency of the uh, entire uh, the antenna coil assembly, which is established by adjusting L5. Um, as a player brings a hand near the pitch antenna, 
the changing impedance of the pitch circuit lowers the VPO circuitry by about frequency by about three kilohertz. Uh, Q3, Q4, and their associated components form the fixed pitch oscillator. The frequency of which is set equal to the VPO frequency by adjusting L6 when the player's hand is away from the pitch antenna. So paraphrasing the rest of this long document, uh, in a heterodyne double oscillator theremin, uh, both of these frequencies sit around 260 kilohertz on the volume antenna. And what eventually comes out of the speaker is the difference between them run through a little bit of wave shaping circuitry. And so the analog circuit is uh, carefully tuned to map these two positions to a range of output frequencies. Uh, and that's achieved via the L I L5 and L6, which are tunable inductors, uh, as well as two fine, two fine adjustment knobs on the front panel, uh, which like open a BJT to like just change a bias voltage very slightly. So that's our basic theory of operation. And this is common to almost, uh, I mean, I haven't studied the other ones, but it's, it's common enough, uh, the heterodyne topology at least. Uh, now let's discuss why it sucks to implement it in practice. <clears throat> so uh, you've created some kind of a theremin. Uh, it, it measures capacitance and sound comes out of the end. Uh, will you be able to make music on it? Uh, so setting aside how it actually sounds, uh, I like to say uh, that there's three L's to look out for, uh, and they are latency, oh, linearity, latency, uh, and inductors. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about linearity. Uh, we're going to define this as like, when I play the instrument, uh, do I get an intuitive sense of how my position influences the output? Um, and all theremins can be fine-tuned to the capacitance of their surroundings and to the user's own body, uh, which is necessary every time you set it up and play. Sorry, we're late. Um, but uh, ultimately, in an analog theremin, what pops out the other end of the speaker is a, like an analog circuit convolution of a bunch of nonlinear circuit functions. Uh, and every parameter of every component involved is going to influence it in ways that uh, most of us probably had not, have not had to think about for 30 plus years. Uh, it doesn't need to be perfect. Uh, I'm not even 30. Uh, you do develop a working understanding of where the notes are, uh, regardless of whether it's uh, a flat linear frequency response, which is not even desirable, really. Uh, but after a certain point, it just becomes unplayable. Uh, you know, you maybe don't want like a quintic function in there, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, recall that we are trying to very closely match the frequencies of these two LC circuits and that by tuning L5 and L6, which are variable inductors, we can get them really close together. Uh, and that we have a very delicate balance between the resonant frequency of the antenna, the coils, and the two oscillators that are all tuned to detect your very small capacitance. Uh, there's a couple of other important points of adjustment as well that all influence the frequency response of the antenna. Uh, there's the, the, the external fine adjustment knob, which you have to turn every time. Uh, this frickin' grounded foil plate mounted between the main PCB and the antenna, which forms a rudimentary parallel varicap. And of course, there's the intrinsic capacitance of the antenna itself, uh, because that's one of the plates of your capacitor. So that's five degrees of freedom. One, two, three, yes, good. Uh, and uh, those are just the elements that are supposed to change. Uh, so uh, you can maybe understand uh, I've never played anyone else's ether wave, but I would guess that like 10% of them maybe are in tune that are out there right now because uh, a lot of those things can change over time without you noticing. And it's really pretty hard to get them back in line without a scope. Uh, I had mine for about 18 months before I really felt like I could get it to make the notes I wanted. Uh, it's a process. Um, so challenging is all. Um, latency. So. Let's define this as how fast the instrument provides feedback. Uh, as we all know from being alive, uh, immediate audio feedback is critical in order to uh, exist, uh, but <laughs> also to uh, triangulate the locations of things. Um, and it's especially uh, important when you don't have any other sensory feedback. Like say, if you are navigating blindly uh, towards a cylinder. Uh, so, uh, you know, if I'm doing this and I don't have uh, an immediate notion of where my hand is, like I don't have a laser rangefinder in my finger, um, and uh, you're all hearing the same sounds that I am. So if I go past a note, I'm going past that note, 
And my goal is to do it before you notice. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, latency isn't really an issue with analog systems because they're analog. Uh, and that's part of why analog theremins are better uh, until now. Uh, but just to give you an example of how tight the detectable window here is, um, if I'm using like a digital audio interface that has like a direct monitor out and it's just like the sound go probably goes through an ASIC and then comes right back out of an op amp. Uh, I think I can still tell uh, if I don't run it, you know, straight out through a speaker. I don't have that tube amp. Uh, and sidebar, uh, one feature, this is kind of directly related. One feature that pretty much all digital theremins have is quantization. Um, and uh, there's two reasons for that. Uh, the first is that applying what's effectively a floor function to your sound output um, is really good at masking the slight delay that's intrinsic to the fact that you're calculating the capacitance with a microcontroller. Uh, and the, uh, there's also the fact that uh, digital theremins, uh, by historically, I mean in the last 20 years, uh, tend to be cheaper and less accurate and don't get hand calibrated. And so uh, all of those things can be mitigated by simply shelving the audio output or the detection that goes into the VCO. Um, the second is that uh, they're intended for beginners. And if uh, you don't have the expectation that you're going to be working on your perfect pitch, uh, it's probably easier to get a nice tune out of something that quantizes to a 12 tone scale. So, it seems like a win-win if you live in a Western country, um, except that playing with a hard quantized theremin signal feels kind of like falling up a flight of stairs. <clears throat> um, ah, inductors. I forgot to do the uh, slide transitions on this one. Um, so the third L. Um, this is a Coilcraft 1 millihenry SMD inductor that I used in a project I'll tell you about soon. Uh, and uh, this is a one millihenry uh, crossover inductor that I got from Parts Express. I didn't get it. It's from Parts Express. Um, I got it from the Parts Express website uh, by taking a screenshot of the website. Uh, <clears throat> and um, there, uh, there's a reason why it's not like we're uh, necessarily running amps and amps through that inductor. Uh, that's the only difference. Um, inductors with ferrite or iron cores are better at storing energy for things like boost converters, and they're smaller, and they have a higher inductance per size, um, and they're cheaper, and they're more manufacturable. Um, but they don't quite hit the Sistine Chapel ideal of the inductor that is simply a loop of wire that uh, restricts current, or uh, <laughs> permits current, um, in a very consistent way. Uh, and so if your inductor looks like that, and it's in a circuit whose only purpose is to be an LC tank measuring capacitance. Um, and also, its inductance is not consistent over the entire frequency range of the oscillation because the entire purpose of it is to sweep the frequency of that oscillator. Um, you're going to end up with a really weird nonlinear open loop behavior. Uh, and so basically, where you end up is uh, Situations where, oh, for instance, let's say you built a theremin and uh, there's, you have very small surface mount inductors where you thought that uh, they would be fine because, you know, what do the, these old websites know anyways? Um, and uh, you're playing and you say, oh, that's, this, is, this is fine. This is actually not a problem at all. Uh, and then the room heats up by one degree. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden there's no sound. Uh, I ended up in a situation where I, I breathed gently onto an inductor, and uh, immediately I went like an octave out of tune, and it didn't go back in tune after it <laughs> went back to the old temperature, um, which I assume is some sort of weird control systems behavior that I slept through in college. Um, also, they just don't make them anymore, the big ones that you need, um, unless you want a Parts Express speaker inductor. Uh, the, uh, what you need is a, uh, well, what, what, the, what Moog uses in their uh, 90s and 2000s era theremins are honeycomb slash pie wound uh, phenolic inductors. Sorry, these are not all, um, these are my notes. Phenolic inductors, uh, no core. Uh, honeycomb or pie wound is like, uh, they look kind of like that. Um, and maybe I have another example, but I can't pass it around just yet. 
Um, and uh, even the modern ether waves that uh, were bit by the fact that these are unviable uh, use like ferrite cord versions of that shape of inductor. Um, and it's, it's kind of a compromise because they get more L per unit volume. Uh, so that's tough. Uh, this is, this is JW Miller. I don't know that, that, uh, they were sold to Borns, everyone's friend Borns. I, I don't have an opinion on Borns really, except that they bought JW Miller and stopped making those inductors in about 2006. <clears throat> uh, well, yeah, so we've taken three L's, uh, and I guess our theremin's going to suck. Uh, Star Wars title crawl, sad trombone dot wave. Um, yeah, hey, just kidding. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't ask for a 55-minute slot if that was the end. Uh, so uh, close your eyes again. Uh, don't actually have to. Uh, and let's revisit a, an alternate timeline in our Fairman Garden of Forking Paths. Uh, it's May 12th, 2012. Uh, Barack Obama is uh, finishing his first term. Uh, the iPhone 4S has just launched, uh, bringing with it a revolutionary AI assistant that will change computing forever. Uh, and uh, Disney Pixar's Brave is about to hit theaters. Um, Elsewhere in the world, uh, in upstate New Jersey, uh, Eric Wallen is a casual musician and theremin enthusiast from the cozy town of Boonton. Uh, he builds FPGA systems at a major telecom company. One day, May 12, 2012, he starts a thread on the theremin forum. Because of course. Let's see what it says. So uh, the thread is entitled, Let's Design and Build a Mostly Digital Theremin. And since 2012, it has been continuously updated with a table of contents. And uh, let's just scroll down to the first post. Uh, he did it. Um, since 2012, and with contributions from the theremin.world.com forum community, uh, Eric applied uh, pretty much every discipline of engineering, self-teaching many, to completely blow past the three L's and build a novel, performance quality, entirely digital, entirely original digital theremin. And uh, he's sold a couple of units as DIY, DIY kits out of his basement. Uh, it is called the DLEV, or uh, Digital Lev. Um, uh, there's around 40 in the world, um, and here are some of them. Uh, they have uh, really primarily gone to theremin owners, uh, and uh, they have a Facebook group where they sing the praises of the instrument and treat him with something beginning to approach religious fervor. Uh, and th these are the real pros. These are a couple of people that actually make money playing the instrument, and they have started to take notice. Um, and they have started to buy kits. It, it is sort of picking up ahead of steam, uh, which is really cool because it's gratifying to see someone's very long running personal project bear fruit, right? I think we can all agree. <laughs> um, so how did he do it? Glad you asked. Uh, <clears throat> it is one FPGA dev kit, uh, two AFE circuits, uh, two handmade inductors, uh, one DAC box and one visual tuner. And uh, he starts here with an FPGA. Uh, what is an FPGA? Well, who's at the precursor workshop? Okay, uh, I'm trying to figure out which set of notes to read. Uh, <laughs> here is the 10 second summary. FPGAs are the chimeras of the integrated circuit world. They are chips that can change their form at will. You don't program them so much as you define their behavior in an HDL or a hardware description language. Um, and that allows you to express your desire for a jumble of circuits that work just so. And uh, this is a slight abstraction, but when you do that, the big blob of silicon inside the chip reforges itself. And at that point, it can become anything. And uh, people usually build with FPGAs if they want to design something with extremely accurate timing or if they want to develop a new processor architecture. Eric manages to do both, which I guess one implies the other, but you know. Uh, so here I'll throw a bone to people that do know about FPGAs. Uh, he's running uh, an Altera EP4 CE6. Um, before the chip shortage, uh, 
I have in my notes that it was a $10 to $15 part, but I, it's probably something like that, right? It's not a, not a special FPGA. It's not a million dollar uh, Intel NDA thing. Uh, I used one in my undergrad electronics lab, uh, and it's been around for a couple of decades, and it's pretty generic at this point, uh, to the point that it's a uh, EOL. Um, <laughs> So uh, rather than using heterodyned oscillators, the, the DLEV FPGA uses uh, one phase lock loop per antenna channel. Um, it sends a pulse train through the AFE circuit, uh, through a parallel inductor, and into the antenna and back. Uh, then it, it reads the returning pulse train, and it calculates the hand capacitance from the phase difference. <clears throat> so uh, let's zoom in on this AFE. Uh, that's it. Um, <laughs> we've got an inductor here similar to the ether wave. There's only one. Um, but uh, okay, this is what I'll tell you about the AFE. Um, what we're looking at is uh, the, the like eight dip part is a an ESD protection diode, and the uh, what is it? Fourteen dip part is a hex inverter, um, and then there is a two N thirty nine oh four, a two N thirty nine oh six. Um, and a couple of jelly bean parts bin resistors and caps. Um, probably costs about three cents. Um, so when I say this is a completely digital theremin, I mean there is not even an ADC involved in this theremin, inside the FPGA or outside the FPGA. It is feeding a pulse train at logic level into a circuit that uh, as a side effect, boosts the pulse train up to about 100 volts peak to peak. So uh, this is an ESD gun. Uh, and uh, reads it back in at logic levels, uh, at which point it has a very precise way of measuring the phase difference and therefore calculating the capacitance. All right, so uh, cool. FPGA project, what kind of vendor IP did he roll with here? Is this a, uh, this is like a, an ARM core, I guess 2012. I, I don't know what was around in 2012. Uh, Certainly not the Pico RV stuff. Um, uh, no, there is no vendor IP. Uh, it is completely free of vendor IP, uh, except apparently for the phase locked loops, which I am told you can't get around. Uh, it is an entirely, completely scratch built, eight thread, 32 bit little Endian processor designed specifically as a host platform for a theremin. Here's the first page of the white paper in all of its open office. Uh, logo formatted in Comic Sans glory, and it's up on his website, um, with some information that I don't really understand, but it's up on his website. Uh, he, he did, he verilogged his very own uh, compute, uh, mass functions like sine and uh, peripherals, uh, UART spy for like the, the bootloader and the serial port, uh, and a synthesis engine, uh, which means floating point, DSP, everything that a a synthesis engine requires. Um, and oh, the synthesis engine. <laughs> Recall the age of the, I mean, I guess I, I don't really know what's impressive, but uh, I think this is pretty impressive. This is, uh, I built this, so <laughs> that's the, uh, there we go.
the Geiger counter. Um, there are some crazy ones that uh, I need to find and let people play with afterwards, but uh, there's about 157 of those. Um, and the whole thing's built in HDL and is like a couple of kilobytes. Um, so yeah, uh, all of those patches can be generated by scrolling through like 10 pages of uh, knobs on the onboard 20 by four LCD. Um, and uh, you can start with a pure sine wave and build the church bell if you want. Um, and uh, then you can dump them all to your computer and get a nice little one kilobyte file <laughs> with all 200 presets. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's cool. Uh, this, you know, there's, there's documentation. I'm not a DSP person, so I, I can't really talk about this too much, but uh, there's some videos of people that are way, way better than me than I wasn't trying to be good just then. Uh, that have made some unbelievable noises with this thing. Uh, so let's evaluate this again from the three L's perspective. Uh, so yes, uh, with other digital theremins, um, when you factor in the time cost of FFTs, denoising, passing control data between the field detector and the synth, generating audio waveforms, it, it does, all of those things uh, can reduce or, well, it is the same, sorry, it's the same with the DLEV in that all of those steps reduce the processing and response, or re, uh, increase the processing time, re, make the latency worse than an analog system that has none of that. Uh, but because we are using an intrinsically parallel processor designed for a theremin application specific purpose, uh, the time cost is really shaved down so low as to be indistinguishable from analog. Um, and it means that there's no need to hard quantize uh, in order to sort of mask the poor responsiveness and the heavy filtering that you would need otherwise. Um, and it makes vibrato technique possible, which is something that's actually really important for professional players. Um, and it, it doesn't even give up the advantage of being approachable uh, because there is a pitch correction feature if you don't have great pitch, uh, but it is not like falling up a flight of stairs. It is. Uh, it's more like getting auto-tuned when you're recording a voice uh, like track. Uh, it will gently sort of snap to grid. Um, and of course you can't feel it, but you can see it. Um, and well, I'll get to why you can see it. Uh, linearity. Um, these slides were a little uh, rushed. Um, it's a, so it's a capacitive sensor, right? It's designed to uh, detect capacitances in a certain range. Um, and uh, in an analog theremin, we have these like five points of uh, degrees of freedom uh, that we use to control the ranges of the oscillators that are sensing the fields. Um, and if your antenna geometry is not within a certain spec, uh, it's impossible to compensate for because the, the frequency difference between the, the varied and invariant oscillators uh, you can't like bias it back into the audible spectrum. So you can't, basically you can't change the size of your antenna without opening the case and turning all the knobs inside. And you can't change it past a certain point without re-engineering the whole system. Uh, so uh, <laughs> like I, I was maybe having some board noise issues here, but I was doing auto calibrations and that just measures the capacitance when I'm not touching it and then compares it to when I am touching it. Um, and, uh, you know, so that makes that a lot faster. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, there's the other advantage that uh, in 2014 on page 94 of the forum thread, uh, there's the derivation of an equation that makes the field processing code much more tolerant to a wider range of uh, like antenna inductances and uh, capacitances um, than would be remotely acceptable in an analog system. Uh, there is like, math that happens that would otherwise have to be done in circuits that the circuit, you can't really build a circuit to do, basically. Um, uh, so, 
Oh, right, then the inductor advantage. Um, Eric winds his own inductors, that's, uh, that's the advantage. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> the tuner, visual tuner. So uh, it would be nice if that video would play, uh, but I can also just show you. Um, the tuner has a 12-pointed star, and each note around the outside, each node on the outside, I suppose, uh, corresponds to a note on the chromatic scale. And uh, there is an immediate visual response uh, because it's using the same pipeline as the synthesizer. I have decalibrated again because everything moved, but. And it's extremely sensitive. Uh, and uh, the top LEDs are corresponding to this one. Although I think when I'm hovering right over the, the tie point for the antenna, it's not snapping properly. Either way, uh, very sensitive, very fast, possibly the fastest, most responsive, like digital UX that I've ever seen. Uh, VR stuff is just, I mean, obviously a different class of product, but I think about all the time uh, <laughs> throwing up in a headset as opposed to uh, seeing things change when you push a button. <clears throat> Ah, there's, there's the video. Well, I have shown you. So uh, nobody's perfect, um, and I spoiled it. This is my version, but the kit that everyone has uh, is, uh, oops, <laughs> uh, is, is a literal out-of-box experience. Um, and I had a picture there of uh, the cardboard box that it comes in being used to create the enclosure. There is no enclosure. Um, it looks kind of like this, except that there's, there's not this box. Um, so everyone that gets one, goes to arts and crafts school. Um, and uh, there's some great results, but it doesn't really make it super scalable. Um, it's bus powered uh, from a, a USB to serial dongle. Um, and it requires an external DAC uh, because it has a Toslink audio output um, for isolation. But really what happens is people just feed the DAC and the instrument from the same USB hub and then get ground loops. Uh, so. Um, and it is generally sort of just a, a really, really, really well-designed and mature breadboard design uh, with a basic PCB. Um, and uh, the EP4 CE6 is at its end of life, and uh, the FPGA is, uh, I think the block RAM is 99.5 utilized. Uh, I think I got an email saying uh, there's 100 bytes free. Uh, of course, luckily it never even approaches something so uh, gaudy as a dynamic allocation, uh, but uh, we do have to take that into account. Um, so I guess this is where I uh, introduce myself. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, still me. These are things I've worked on, actually. Uh, I have a couple of things that were on Hackaday like uh, very many years ago. Um, I have been known to do hardware and software. Uh, I like input-output devices. I taped out a chip once in college, um, and I'm really into automatons. I actually built a digital automaton when I was 18 or something, and uh, that uh, sort of uh, that was when I knew I had a problem. Uh, so I, this is still me. Um, I had a musical upbringing, uh, as you might have surmised from like this whole talk, uh, the uh, subtle Asian traits and uh, my aforementioned uh, anxiety. Um, and I played piano growing up, but I had like a psychosomatic blockage, uh, sp specifically when I was performing, and it made it really hard for me to keep playing. So my foot would seize up during a recital, uh, and it happened two or three times after like 15 years, and uh, after a while it was no fun. I was like, I can't do this anymore. So. Um, Oh, there's, there's me at the piano. Uh, in May 2020, uh, a famously good month of mental health for everyone, I <laughs> purchased an Etherwave, uh, and I played it through lockdown. And it's kind of a hard instrument to practice, but I got some quality time in uh, because it was that time. Uh, and last fall, I had gotten kind of back into it after a break. Uh, and I'd read bits of the DLEV thread in the documentation, and I was like, oh, I could contribute to this. I can do like electronics. Um, and I was at a conference last fall that some of you may have also been at, uh, talking to a complete stranger, um, trying to decide uh, like how to express how cool this project was and like what 
what the instrument was capable of uh, from what I'd seen online and uh, you know, what it really means to some people. And uh, you know how it is, like second day of a conference, uh, you're like maybe drank too much coffee in the morning, you haven't had lunch yet, you're a little hungover and uh, you're having a conversation about your hobby and all of a sudden you tear up and you start crying, talking to a complete stranger that you met five minutes ago. Uh, uh, anyways, based on that episode, I decided to double down. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I realized that uh, fairmans were awesome and I wanted to have more of them. So after, <laughs> after the conference, I wrote to Eric. Uh, I drove to his house. Um, I wrote, when I wrote to him, I said that I would drive to his house. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I bought a D-Lev kit. Um, and I set it up on a pegboard from Ikea. And uh, the antennas are made of copper foil. It's just copper tape and it's alligator clips to one of these, uh, quote, AFEs. Um, so truly nothing fancy. And I sat down and I started playing it. Um, and I got up seven hours later. Uh, and I said, ow, my arm. Uh, so uh, I, I, I wrote Eric back and I said, can you, make, like, what if you made this a product? And he said, well, I don't want to make a product. And I said, why not? And he said, well, there's no money in it. And I said, well, I think, you know, who knows, right? But there might be money in it. And he said, well, not that many people want theremins in their lives. And I said, Okay, maybe that's true, but uh, like, have you considered the people that, that don't know if they want theremins yet, uh, that have never thought that they might want a theremin before? Uh, and he said, uh, well, not really. Why, why would I do that? And I said, you know, these days, if you know the right people and uh, techniques and uh, things to buy on Amazon, you can just make 1,000 of something and not either one or 100,000. And like you, you quit your job and spent 10 years doing this and there's people lining up outside your house like throwing wads of cash at you. And he said, well, I don't need to make money off of this. I just want it to be open source. And I said, I don't know if those are mutually exclusive. Uh, do you mind if I take a stab at it? And he said, by all means. Um, but I, I had to warm up first. So I made another theremin, uh, <clears throat> this one. Uh, so this is, a, this is an analog theremin. It's pretty similar to the Moog ones I described. There's a, it's a dual LC heterodyne oscillator. Um, a huge shout out to Art Harrison, the designer of this. Uh, he is one of the only independent theremin makers that is still operating. I, actually, he recently, like a couple weeks ago, retired. But um, he published this design online uh, in 2000. Uh, and it's, it's similar to Moog's, but it doesn't use the tunable uh, variable inductors. Um, and you can't shrink those down into an SMD format. So uh, I basically built it into a credit card form factor, which to my knowledge uh, is the smallest dual LC heterodyne theremin made. Um, it's not perfect. Ask me how I know what the three L's are. Uh, <laughs> it fails all of them, uh, except for latency. Uh, this is the one where you breathe on and it goes out of tune because I did not listen uh, when I read his emails and I did not, uh, spec the inductors extremely carefully. Um, so, uh, you know, you learn from your experiences and uh, it's playable. You just have to tune it really carefully and uh, not expect it to stay there for more than about five minutes. Uh, and uh, I, mm, I, my document camera didn't work, so I have a couple of, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna hold it under there, but uh, I will uh, show some pictures of the board design because I think I did some cool stuff. Um, we've entered the show and tell zone, by the way. Uh, so, um, I uh, developed a process to handwrite on silkscreen in uh, a software called Aciprite, which is for 2D game development. And it is much faster to handwrite in Aciprite uh, than it is to do it in a better, like more complete, more, more creative oriented, uh, or nothing against Aciprite, it's great, uh, against uh, like Photoshop or something. Because if you want to load up a huge high res picture of a PCB and like, squish it down to one bit because that's what you want for your silk screen or your copper layers, um, it, it's better to just have a black and white image. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the best software I found actually for drawing on boards, uh, pro tip. Um, and so yeah, I have uh, my own handwriting just all over the whole thing and I label all of the different sections of the circuit uh, and I like draw a little like family circle like arrows around showing the like kid running from the variable oscillator to the fixed oscillator. Um, and, uh, and then I made a carrier board, which is the antenna the bottom antenna, and uh, the carrier board, uh, we're surface mounting down like five different uh, 
of these like PEM solder down standoffs. Uh, and that passes through power ground um, signal and antenna. And uh, then there's a volume knob on the bottom board that just uh, like is a dumb attenuator for the output. Um, and uh, so I thought this was kind of cute. Uh, this is like my first board that I actually ever designed and assembled. Um, so uh, I, that's not quite true, but you know, one of the first, first five. Uh, so, uh, oh yeah, and then I did some other cool stuff. I did some, I did a little like dedicational silk screen on the bottom and I did, uh, I took the original GIF schematic from his website and I put it into the copper layer. Uh, so you can actually just read off the entire schematic from this thing uh, if you ever like forget what the parts are and need to replace them. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah. And oh, there's the document because this is just my laptop. Oh no, my phone's working. Wow, sweet, okay. Well, there, there's the there's the tuner. Um, it's uh, noisy because my phone cable is going through it, but uh, all right. Well, we're at almost at time. Uh, so uh, then I, a couple weeks later, I just went right back and started up up revving the, the DLAB boards because uh, why not, right? So I went from a credit card like passive board to a, an FPGA. Um, but uh, I found, luckily, uh, rather than the socketed dev board, I found a stamp module, which is still in stock on Taobao. It costs like one third as much uh, and uses something with a little bit more block RAM and logic. Um, and it is uh, no, about, about half the cost and uh, doesn't give you a lot of extra Z height and stuff you don't want. Um, and uh, I added a DAC. Um, it's maybe on the next slide. Uh, and I refined, I refined all of the like core boards that were in the system. And so this, these are all just original boards that I just uh, purchased, assembled, and glued together like last week. Um, so I'm very happy with it. Uh, so uh, yeah, here's the family photo, but I also have them right here. Um, yeah, better FPGA, four layer boards, SMT components. The components were exclusively through hold. Now they're exclusively SMT. Uh, a brand new IO board. Uh, with the DAC and uh, also has a microcontroller running Joey's Gossamer framework that is going to uh, work as a USB converter and uh, for, for the serial debug output and a MIDI converter as well because there's a like standard 31.5 kilobaud MIDI output. Um, so I don't know if these are good uh, per se. Like I would not uh, like start a crowd supply thing uh, this instant, uh, but it's sort of intended uh, to take one step closer to manufacturability and, and uh, like basically not place undue burden on one person to uh, like distribute these things. Um, and I'm hoping that if anyone wants one, I can figure out how to uh, get them into people's hands because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this thing. Um, another couple notes. Oh, great, it's my crotch. Uh, not sure anyone's documented this particular stamp form factor in English yet. Uh, so if, if anyone wants like a lattice part in a stamp form factor, I have that. Um, and uh, we got uh, also Molex connectors instead of the big eight pin IEC connectors on the original boards. Um, also, KiCad curb traces, love them. They're everywhere. Uh, and oh yeah, and I got, I didn't want to do the handwriting annotation on these boards because they were too big and they even crashed ASAPrite, but uh, I did make a font with my handwriting and used it for all the reference designators because you can do that with KiCad 7. Uh, and uh, you know, sometimes you wanna just be like looking at the board under the microscope, like pulling off a component and be reminded that you in fact exist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, that one's relatable. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, here's the deck, what I was just talking about and my phone pointing at myself. Uh, yeah, so uh, Sam D11, uh, know all about those peripherals now. Um, Ref does, uh, and there's a buck converter, so you can use it with like a 12 volt power supply and that feeds five volts to all the main boards. Um, okay, AFE, I've had the yeah, camera. Uh, oh, like I'll point it at the AFE now. The quote AFE. Um, those inductors you can't get anymore? Uh, I went on Alibaba.com and I searched for honeycomb RF pi mount pi one uh, phenolic inductors, one millihenry, two millihenry, uh, and they were like, "Yeah, sure, you want some?" And I was like, "Ooh, how much?" 
expecting to spend $800. And they said, eh, five bucks. Um, I was like, really? And they were like, yeah, like quantity what? One. Uh, okay, <laughs> cool, sold. So I, I bought 10, I uh, spent $55 and they uh, shipped to my door. Uh, and uh, I could tell them what inductance I wanted. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is my tuner uprev also. This is a cool thing I did here. Uh, feel a little cool thing I did. Uh, no, um, I was not content with just going from surface mount to, uh, or from through hole to surface mount. I went from through hole to reverse surface mount. So all of the components uh, go through the board, um, including the segment display, which tells you what octave you're on. So the pictures on the left are uh, where I very, predictably pin swapped the top and bottom sides of that seven segment and then had to get an Oshpark bodge board to service mount down and swap the pins in the X axis. Um, okay, um, wrapping up. Uh, I'm not claiming that my work here in the last couple of months has been particularly magical. Uh, I didn't like design any circuits. I didn't read any algorithms. I didn't, I ran a couple simulations to make this, but like, I reflowed some boards, I got a little better at KiCad, I didn't write any code. I treated the whole thing as an exercise to basically just get better at uh, like design and assembly. Um, and uh, I only really understand as much as I've told you so far about how this device works. Um, I treat a lot of things as black boxes. So I would love to engage more deeply with the like meat of the science and the signal processing and to generally just get more eyes on how this thing works. And I email Eric all the time, so it's not like, it's not like he's inaccessible, but I'm trying to get these into more people's hands uh, because I think it's really, really cool. Um, he's still actively working on the project. Um, I think he's looking forward to having something with more resources so he's not 99.5% utilized. Um, and uh, you know, there, it would be great to have people contributing to the system because he's been working on it alone since 2012. Um, and also, I want to get it to people that don't own theremins yet. <laughs> I, don't, I think zero people have bought one of these that don't already own a theremin, which is nuts because they're cool synthesizers, uh, and they could be cool hid devices, um, and they could be cool, uh, a lot of other things, uh, touch, touch designer projection mapping uh, control axes. Um, they could be cool eFabless ASICs, given that they don't use any vendor blobs. Uh, I just got that idea this morning. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that the end point of my work is something a like a crowdfund project that could be sold on some sort of crowdfunding platform, if anyone knows one. Uh, <clears throat> but like, you know, you don't have to do that. Um, I, uh, you know, and to give a concrete example, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that uh, if I can get this to someone, uh, it will be at some point plopped into Yosis next PNR and then have it running on like a lattice, uh, either the i40 or the next one up, depending on how much resources. I, I did Google this at some point, but uh, that would be really good to, to get it uh, shrunk down and cheaper and more manufacturable. Um, and uh, at that point, it's kind of off to the races, right? Then you just pull out the field sensing blocks, cram them into like a, a FOMU and have your FOMU uh, blasting out a pulse wave through a, one of these things, um, talking somewhere else over like a NRF like enhanced shock burst like thing so you can network them. I don't know, like <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool body of work, right? Uh, obviously Eurorack. Um, so if, if, if anyone has any ideas, this is gonna be on the table um, and I am gonna try and figure out how much it'll cost to build a couple more boards. Um, and uh, these are, these, oh yeah, these are some, this is some work we've already done. Um, Desiloing escaping documentation. Hell, actually, that's first because there is 10 to 12 years of documentation that uh, needs to maybe be uh, read by people. Um, and uh, I, I will be working on the antenna geometries uh, and building an enclosure. Uh, I met someone at Open Hardware Summit who built me this. Um, that's the website. Uh, and uh, those are all the things I just said. So, last slide. I promised I would have a better answer for why you should care at the beginning of the talk. Do I like this because it makes me feel like I am in the past? Or because I'm in the future? 
or because I am in the past's idea of the future. I think that does it for a lot of people. That's why a lot of people buy theremins. Uh, all of those things matter if that's what you're into, but that, not really. I actually have problems living even in the present. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> so uh, I like it for the same reason that anyone likes an instrument. It's a tool for making music. Um, it helps you find yourself, uh, and it's played and it's experienced differently than anything else ever. I say this about theremins in general, and this in particular. Um, it, learning it takes like skill and creativity and tenacity, and some people will find themselves playing it in ways that they wouldn't find themselves anywhere else. Uh, and I think that over the century plus of its existence, this instrument was just uh, like kind of robbed of a future in which it was just an instrument, like in the fullness of all that implies. Uh, something you might just pick up and play to make yourself feel better. Uh, something you might go to lessons for and take too seriously or not that seriously. Something you can struggle with and fight with and reconcile with later and. Uh, Use it to teach your friends. Use it to befriend your teachers. Uh, and you know it's important because if any instrument is a social object. It has a, a social aspect, even if it is the weirdest, most solitary solo thing ever. You can look any professional thereminist on YouTube from the last 20, 25 years started learning. Um, and it corresponds to a period of renewed interest in the instrument. And it corresponds to having high quality, reasonably priced instruments available. Uh, and if they're lucky, it also corresponds to their being a teacher. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, uh, all I'd need to do for this to feel worth it would be to help out like a goofy 20-something who uh, like wishes he could pick up the piano again. Thank you. <laughs>